So, uh, Tuesday night, we completed chapter 1, verses 25 through 29. And we called the lesson doing what God calls us to do. The Apostle Paul said in verse 25, as he was writing this letter, Where have I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. By the way, sometimes churches make a big thing of this word dispensation. Some churches teach there are seven dispensations throughout history of, as far as... Um, I, I don't know if they're saying... I think they're saying throughout the Bible, the dispensation of innocence in the garden and so forth. And they say there are seven of them Basically, what the word dispensation means is a pouring out. So Paul is simply saying here that I am a minister according to what God has poured out on me, the uh, dispensation of God which was given to me to fulfill the Word of God. Paul had done nothing. He's one of the most dedicated men who ever lived, always. When he hated the church, he was dedicated. He hunted down Christians and arrested them, persecuted them. When he was a young Pharisee, he was a dedicated man, always dedicated. But he spent the first part of his life dedicated against God. That's not entirely true. Against God that was revealed in Jesus. The God that Jesus revealed. He really clung to the God that Moses revealed. Because he was a Pharisee. He studied the law of Moses. And he thought the Jews were a sect that was infecting the world with bad things. And he wanted to fix it. So even when he was bad, he was dedicated thinking he was doing good. But my point is, like you and I, he did nothing to deserve God's grace. Nothing. God didn't pick him out because he said, oh, there's a good guy. Man, I've watched him live his life. He's never done anything wrong. That's not why he picked him out. If God picked him out that way, he'd only had one guy to pick And that would be Jesus, the Son. All the rest of us failed miserably. God picked Paul in spite of Paul. Because he wanted to. That's what Ephesians 1 tells us. God does everything according to the good pleasure of his will. And he doesn't have to explain it to any of us. He's in charge. He thought, I'm going to take that rascal right there and I'm going to turn him into something good for me. And he did. And so Paul said, here in chap- in verse 25, what made me a minister? God poured out something on me. God anointed me to be a minister. That's why I'm a minister. To fulfill the Word of God. Now, what's odd about this? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You couldn't figure out God if you tried 24-7 every day the rest of your life. He had 12 guys following him around for three, three and a half years. Every day. One of them was a scoundrel, Judas. The other 11 were sincere. They followed him when Jesus died and was wrecked the resurrection and ascended to heaven, they all became ministers. They went around, mostly the Jewish community. They were apostles to the Jews. Paul to the Gentiles. Everybody but the Jews, although Paul was a Jew. And so he always preached to a Jew whenever he could. But his calling was to preach to the non-Jews. And so God picked this scoundrel. What did he have in Moses? Moses was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter, worshiping idols. What about Abraham? When God one day said, Abraham, follow me. 
He was working for his dad who made idols. We think God just looks around and finds the best folk and calls them. And don't get me wrong. God has nothing against good folk and He calls them. But I tell you, He'll pick the scoundrels. And Paul was one of them. And so God called him for one reason and one reason only, because he wanted to. Paul didn't do anything to earn it. Did everything to not earn it. I did nothing to deserve God's grace. I did everything not to deserve God's grace. Yet he's given me his grace. That's the amazing thing about God. So he said, God has poured out a dispensation on me. I'm bringing all this up about Paul and the other 11 because I want you to know after personally Jesus, personally teaching those other 11 for three, three and a half years, God, when the rapture, I mean when the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is complete, when He ascends to heaven and the church is born on the day of Pentecost, when all that happens, Peter stands up and gives a great message on the day of Pentecost. Thousands are saved on that very first day. Great movement. But God had another guy in mind to carry the gospel not to the Jews, but to the non-Jews. And that's all Gentile means. You're not a Jew. People have misunderstood me thinking that um, that's another nationality. A Gentile is every ethnicity. Uh, es- 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 well, I'm not getting it. What is it? Ethnicity. Ethnicity, yeah. It's another one. It's, it's got nothing to do. Uh, the gospel has nothing to do with the, just the Jew. And the Gentile is everybody who's not a Jew. That's what a Gentile is. So Paul was sent to that crowd. The Jews were serving, they thought, Jehovah. The Gentiles were serving idols made with their hands and then calling them God and offering sacrifices to them. But here's the thing that amazes me most about Paul. When God chose this man, He gave this man a specific ministry. When He called Moses, He took Moses out in the desert and revealed Himself in a burning bush. When He called Paul, after Paul got saved, He took him out into a desert and taught him personally the gospel. Paul said, no man gave me anything concerning this gospel but God. Peter didn't teach it to him. John didn't teach it to him. James didn't teach it to him. God taught it to him. Nobody gave Moses the law except God. Nobody gave Paul the gospel except God. It was a special dispensation. The most important message on planet earth was given to that one man. The most imp- and he didn't follow Jesus around for three years. You say, why did God do it that way? I don't know. Ask him when you get there. God does what God wants to do. Sometimes I think he has, he has a sense of humor. I don't know. But uh, nonetheless, the message that Paul teaches in Romans 1... 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And uh, then he goes on to say, for therein, in that gospel that I'm not ashamed of, therein, in that gospel, uh, we discover how to live out our lives for God. It's the most important message in the church age is the gospel. Nobody gets to heaven without believing the gospel. It's the only message on earth that will get you there. None other. No politician has a message that will get you to earth. 
or to heaven rather. <laughs> Their message is to keep you on earth. But God, uh, God gave Paul a message that will get you to heaven. So why God does it again, I'll just keep saying it. He did it because he wanted to. And he doesn't ask anybody for counsel. You know, God has never one time called me on my cell and said, Dave, what do you think I ought to do about this? <laughs> Not once. He does what he wants. <laughs> Again, Ephesians 1 said, he does everything after the counsel of his own will. <laughs> he just throws the things around in his head and said, oh, that's what I'll do. And he does it. And Paul had that beautiful message. It was a dispensation God gave him. Now, because I took more time on that than I wanted, I'm going to drop right down to chapter 2. Now, walking out the Christian walk. By the way, uh, in the review, the reason I posted those three words that I mentioned Tuesday night, just so I could say them again. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Wow! I said, I want to say that again. So I put him in the review. Um, the hardest thing to figure out is God. Probably the second hardest thing to figure out is me. Uh, for I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at, at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my faith in the flesh. So, it's not a big issue, but there's an issue there where some of the commentaries disagree with each other. Paul's writing to the Colossians. It is believed that he started the church in Colossus. He was there in that city, Colossus, birthed a church, and now he said, um, I want to come to you for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. In other words, you who have never seen me, I want to come and visit with you. And so the conflict in commissaries, and it's not a big conflict, it has nothing to do with your eternal welfare or anything. But some take that to mean Paul was never in Colossus, that he didn't start that church. David Gusick, one of my, he's a modern day uh, commentary, uh, co uh, commentator who uh, is still live preaching today. And um, he believes that uh, in his note, apparently Paul had never visited Colossus himself. Um, Barnes has a big long note, I posted the whole thing there. Uh, he said, the passage does not seem to me to prove that he had not been there. It may mean that he had great solitude for those Christians there whom he knew, and for all others there are in the vicinity, even though he was not personally acquainted with them. He may refer, and this is Albert Barnes talking, he may refer to some church churches in the neighborhood formed since he was there, or to the strangers who had come in there since he was with them, in other words, new churchgoers, are to those who had been converted since he was there, new Christians now in the church, with whom he had no personal experience. For all these he would feel the same solitude, for they were all exposed to the same danger, that danger being persecution of the church. Uh, to see one's faith in the flesh, it's Hebraism, uh, in other words, it's a saying of the Hebrews, meaning to become personally acquainted with him. So, Barnes sees it different. I, I love, most of the time, David Gusick's one of my favorite commentators. In this case, I side with Barnes, and I'll tell you why. Paul tells us in Romans 15.20. I don't have the verse there. You can look it up. But Paul tells us in Romans 15.20 that his mission, his mission was to preach what no one else had yet preached. Paul said, I 
1520 of Romans, he said, I don't want to go and build on someone else's foundation. He wanted to be the one that laid the founding truths in each church. So that was something Paul said. Then why would he be wanting to go to Coloss if he didn't start the church? That would be inconsistent with what he said. Paul was a man who hungered, spiritually speaking, for virgin territory. He didn't want to follow up some other preacher. He wanted to be the one. He didn't want to on-teach before he taught. He wanted to go in there and teach the gospel. And because of that, I'm a firm believer that Guthick is wrong and Barnes is right there. I believe he had not only been in Colossae, he had started the church there, and uh, and now he was coming back, but it seems the more the devil kicks and bites and scratches, the more the church grows. And so, there's a lot of persecution going on at that time. Lots and lots of persecution of Christians. And so people getting saved. At a time when you think the last thing they'd want to do is get saved. They were getting saved. God works wonders when it seems that it would be impossible to work that kind of a wonder. So down in verse 2 of Colossians 1, instead of the King James Version for this one, I use the easy to read version for verse 2 here. I want them to be strengthened in the ones he's saying up in verse 1 that I want to meet those that are now among you that weren't there when I was there. So he said, I want them to be strengthened and joined together with love and to have the full confidence that comes from understanding. I want them to know completely the secret truth that God has made known. That truth is Christ himself. You want to know what the most important truth in the Bible is? Jesus. That's the most important truth in the Bible right there. That's what Paul's saying in that verse. He's saying that truth is Christ himself. So, like all Christians, Albert Barnes says, in the times of the apostles, they were doubtless exposed to trials and persecution. So, he was saying he wanted them to be knit together in the King James. uh, And uh, in the Septuagint, it means, the Greek word means to instruct. He wanted them instructed putting together in one's mind and so to conclude by comparison. In other words, he wanted them all to study and learn and come to the same conclusions regarding Jesus. So what did Paul desire for those he was referring to in verse 2? He wanted their hearts to experience comfort even though it was a time of persecution. He wanted them to lovingly come to the same spiritual conclusions. I'll touch on that in a moment. He wanted them to fully understand the mystery of God regarding the church consisting of all believers, whether Jews or Gentiles. He wanted them to understand, obviously, that Jesus Jesus isn't just the God of the Jews. He's also the God of the non-Jews. And he wanted them to understand these things. And he said in verse 3, In whom? In this Jesus, after he ends verse... uh, Two with that truth is Christ himself in verse 3 he said in whom in other words in Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge um, if it isn't in him it isn't that all knowing or that all wise Jesus is wisdom and knowledge alright now put that over if you would The Good News Bible of verse uh, verse 3. Again, on the other side, verse 3 is in the King James, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Flipping it over, the, the translation in the Good News Bible is, He is the key that opens all the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. And man, is that true. If you don't get Jesus, you don't get God. You say, if you don't understand Jesus, you don't understand God. He's the spitting image of his Father. He told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to understand the Father who no man has ever seen? Study Jesus. 
So, let's go on with verse, uh, he said the verse 4. Well, uh, first, uh, under Good News Bible there, what is this verse telling us about Christ Jesus? Everything of eternal importance can be discovered by examining the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and by studying what the apostles teach about Christ. The reason I teach mostly out of the epistles is because the epistles are what God says to the church, and you and I are the church. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff in Psalms and Proverbs and in the Old Testament Bible stories, uh, a lot of good things. Uh, and over the years, I've preached on a lot of Bible stories. I uh, preached through the book of Proverbs one time. Um, but Solomon was a man of wisdom, but Jesus was wisdom personified never been any one like him nor will there ever be except the Father and the Spirit alright so in this I say in verse 4 after he said in verse 3 that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Jesus he tells us why he said that in verse 4 in this I say lest any man should beguile you with enticing words with good sounding arguments with arguments you want to believe enticing he said I don't want people to mess with your mind with doctrines of enticing words wording it just right man I want to believe that Paul said, if it isn't truth, I don't want you to believe it. Look at what he said. And, and again, under verse 4, the, the uh, living Bible's rendering of that, as I'm saying this, because I'm afraid someone may fool you with smooth talk. So look at Galatians 1, 6-8. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Every time Paul would establish a church in goal, Judaizers would come. And they'd preach the mixture of law and grace. They'd say, yeah, you were saved by grace, but now you stay saved by keeping the rules. That happened throughout the first century church, and uh, I tell you, it's happening today. The two biggest heirs of the New Testament era that you read about in the epistles are law, in other words, the two L's I call them, legalism. The only way to heaven is to keep enough rules. The only way to get God to love you is to keep enough rules. Do you know he saved you when you were his enemy, the Bible says? You didn't get saved because you became his friend. He saved you when you were his enemy. This God works in unusual ways, folks. You can't win God over. He wants to save you. That's what he's up to. And uh, so in Galatians... Well, I said legalism, the two L's of the first century were the, the two biggest errors that the apostles had to correct. John really hits the second one, license. Legalism, Paul fights against in almost every epistle he wrote. License, that's what First John's all about. What is license? Now that you're saved, God doesn't care what you do. Party! So one, legalism is, I don't dare do anything. License is, oh God loves me no matter what I do. They're the same two heirs running through the churches in America today. It's never changed. 
the ones that John was fighting, the ones that Paul was fighting with the teachers of the law, the ones John was fighting were called Gnostics. Again, the word Gnostic means to know. It's a Greek word. New Testament written in Greek. It means to know. That's the Greek word for knowing. You throw an A in front of that, that's a negative. Agnostic. Now it means you don't know. So an atheist thinks he knows there's no God. An agnostic says there might be a God, there might not be. I don't know. The A changes knowing to not knowing. In this group of Gnostics taught all kinds of air, and John fought against them like crazy. And I'm going to tell you, folks, Gnosticism, people who are telling us that now that Jesus has died for our sins, took away the sins of the world, ascended to heaven, always interceding for us, God is no longer angry. Party down. No, they don't quite put it that way, but that's a doctrine being taught in churches in America today. God loves you just as you are. A friend of mine, Kevin Fleming, always says, yeah, he loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. God's desire is for us to become like his son, Jesus. To walk in his footsteps. All right? So, in Galatians 1, he said, I marvel that you are so soon. Now, Paul's talking to those who are starting to believe some garbage. He said, after he left Galatia, uh, that Paul's teachers came in and started teaching. And he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Listen to what he said, which is not another. What they're telling you is not good news. That's what gospel means. They're dragging you away from the genuine good news and giving you bad news that you are mistaking for good news. He said is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, Paul saying we, me and my team, are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be cursed. And then the next verse he said, if I come back and preach another gospel, let me be cursed. You know what Paul's saying? If I ever show back up in Galatia and teach you anything different than I taught you the first time, may I go to hell. May God send me to hell. This man fought for the gospel because God put him in charge of the gospel. He was the one that God gave the dispensation of sharing this good news with the world. Man, did he fight for it. He fought really, really hard for it. Now, verse 5. And again, I, I have an answer down there. He didn't want the Colossians to be deceived. Uh, he desires that these false teachers uh, be condemned to hell there in Galatia and wherever they were teaching. Uh, if they were messing with God's children... Um, Paul wanted them saved or God wanted them he had no mercy for them at all All alright verse 5 now why uh, that note before verse 5 Paul's desire that the gospel message be presented in its true form is so strong that he says that if anyone perverting the message should be condemned to hell even if that someone were an angel or Paul himself 5 verse 5 For though I be absent in the flesh, Colossians, I'm not there right now, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So there are some good things going on in the church of Colossians. And he's uh, very happy about that. He started this whole thing. My first lesson was how do the Colossians get on the everyday prayer list of God. It wasn't, or, or Paul, it wasn't by being naughty, it was by being good. They were walking out the gospel. And so Paul seen potential in them. And because he seen potential in them, he prayed for them every day. We pray for the sickest. Nothing wrong with that. We pray for the weakest. Nothing wrong with that. We pray for the ones struggling the most. Nothing wrong with that. 
But Paul put the group that was very strong spiritually at the top of his prayer list because they had potential to make a difference. And he prayed for them. In Colossians, there were believers in Colossians that were among that list. All right, so he said in verse 5 again, Though I be absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in the spirit. And... uh, Joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, there are different comments there. I'm not going to take time on them. You can take the notes home and read them if you like. But, um, what he means by that, uh, again, there's some interesting notes. I'm not going to get detailed on those right now. What is verse 5 telling us? Paul rejoiced in their order. That's the word he used up in verse 5. As he saw them as Christian soldiers, each standing in the place they should be. He also rejoiced in the steadfastness of their faith as he saw them as forming a military line that could withstand the attack of the Gnostic believer, or Gnostic teachers trying to infiltrate the church with them. You know, when you look at legalism and license, I don't, I don't think I could pick which is worse. The one you're deceiving people that if they grit their teeth and try really hard, they're going to heaven. That's not the way to heaven. That's a lie. And the other you're telling, oh, Jesus took away the sins of the world. We're good. And that doesn't work. Jesus said, no man comes unto the Father but by me. John in his gospel wrote, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth not is condemned already. You know, they might not know it yet. They're walking around. But if your faith is in Christ, you're walking in a state of condemnation before God. And our job is to pray and pray that they find Christ before they die. Because if they don't, and then uh, they're condemned already, the Bible says. They're stepping before God at the great white throne judgment, already condemned. Verse 6. By the way, the reason I mentioned military, some of these commentaries are talking about how Paul was using a military metaphor. And so... um, that's what I was talking about there when I said um, what I said he rejoiced in the steadfast he'd seen them at forming a military line that's based on the comments of those uh, commentators up there verse 6 as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him so what's that telling us most commentators and you will not meet a bigger fan of commentators than me I've got tons of them on my phone. This little old phone, uh, I have an app called eSword.net, and I got commentator after commentator. Probably 2025 here. If I really want to know between a couple thoughts, I'll start looking at every one of them and see what they say about it. I love commentators. Anybody who comments on the entire Bible impresses me. And... uh But having said that, by the way, I've written commentary in four epistles. When I wrote one on Ephesians, it humbled me because I was disagreeing with some commentator that I have so much respect for. And that's humbling. That's humbling. You don't have to agree with everything someone says to have an abundance of affection and respect for them. So, but verse 6, this is what I want to conclude with in this bottom part here. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Most commentators tell us that Paul simply stating to his readers that since they have placed their trust in Christ, they should walk out the new faith. I think there's more to it than that. Because that same guy wrote the two verses that to me are near the top as the most important verses in the New Testament. Or Galatians 3, 2 and 3. This only what I learn of you, receive you the Spirit by the work of the law, by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you made perfect by the flesh? Now, if you notice your notes, in verse 2 and 3, I have a section underlined. On both verse and 
uh, verses 2 and 3, I have a, uh, in both verses, I have a phrase emphasized uh, by dark black. What I'm doing is I'm showing you how these two verses agree. He's, he's asking you a question. Paul's asking you a question. How did you get saved? By keeping all the rules or by hearing about Jesus and believing on Him and with your faith? How did you get saved? Then in verse 3, he said, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit. Wait, we just said he got saved by faith. The two things he uses in the King James Bible in verse 2 is how'd you get this beginning to your Christian walk? Whether the doing of the law or the hearing of faith. Rhetorical question, you get saved by faith is the answer. Verse 3, having begun in the Spirit. He just told us in verse 2, now we got in the Spirit and by the flesh. What are the corresponding matches? The hearing of faith is in the Spirit. Having begun in the Spirit, you got saved by faith in the Spirit. Are you not made perfect by the flesh, the doing of the law? And we need to make that connection so we understand this Christian walk. He said, are you foolish? You started by believing. You think you're going to grow a different way? You think you're going to grow up in the faith by trying really hard? Or walking out the freedom that's in the Lord? Or walking in the Spirit, knowing that what Jesus says about me is true? And I'm going to wrap that up here in a moment with some uh, examples at the bottom. So that's what I believe he's saying as you as you receive Christ, walk it out. The same way you received it, by believing what Jesus said, walk it out by believing what Jesus says. As you receive Him, that's the way you're supposed to walk it out. All right, now, watch this. We grow in the Christian experience the same way we become Christians. We grow by hearing by the hearing of faith, according to Colossians um, three verse two. That's how we got into it, so that's how we're going to grow. We grow by the hearing of faith, in other words, believing his promises. We don't grow spiritually by trying harder to keep the works of the law. First John two six He that says he abides in him out himself also to walk even as he walked. We find ourselves living the Christian life and walking as Jesus walked when we believe the amazing things the New Testament tells us about ourselves. Did you know the New Testament is littered with good news about you? Littered. And I just gave four examples to wrap this up with. Second Corinthians 5.17 You're a new creature in Christ. You're not who you used to be. You know the verse, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. That's pretty good news. And I can't emphasize enough. This is the way people read that verse. If any man be in Christ, he's gradually becoming different than he used to be. Some of the bad habits are gradually dropping away, and he's gradually getting some better habits. That's not what it says. This is all in the present tense. If you're in Christ, you right now are a new creature. If you're in Christ right now, the old is gone. You say, why don't I walk that out? Because you don't believe it. If you're in Christ right now, everything about you is new. Why don't I walk it out? Because you don't believe it. Do what the father of the, of the demoniac said to Jesus when he said, do you believe? He said, I do believe. believe. Help thou my non-belief. God, I believe what you say. Help me work on the areas I'm struggling believing. Because the victory is believing. We can't... That's not how life works. Life is about picking up a hammer and building something. Life is about setting an alarm clock and getting out of the house and making some money. That's how life works. But that's not how spirituality works. Spirituality believes 
on our, our growth, our spirituality grows as we believe what Jesus says about it. The second bullet, sin shall not have dominion, dominion over us because we are under the power of God's grace. Romans six fourteen. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're under grace. You say, I struggle with sin. That's foolish. Quit acknowledging that. Sin does not have dominion over you. God said it. Is he a liar? He's got a liar. Is he lying to you? God said, sin shall not, through the Apostle Paul, sin shall not have dominion over you. Shall not dominate you. Why? Because you're not under the law, but under grace. You see, when you keep rules, when you put yourself under the law, it strengthens sin. The strength of sin is the law, the Bible says. You get off and under the law and start walking under grace, and it has no power over you. All right? You say, I feel... Well, what does that mean? If you're not believing what he said. So what's the challenge? God, help my unbelief. I want to believe everything you say about me. You don't beat yourself up, but you acknowledge my faith isn't in line with what you're saying. Help me in this area, Father. We are partakers of God's nature. Second Peter one four can't get better than that. We have been made. It said in verse three, the exceeding and great uh, promises of God are given to us that we might partake of divine nature. We think the promises of God are given to us so we can get rich. So we can always be well. So we can always be blessed. Have a bigger house. So we can have this and that. Peter wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, God's given you those promises so that you can partake of His nature. There is no greater wealth, folks. And then finally... God destroyed the power of sin in my flesh. Romans 8.3 You have to read, to get the full meaning of Romans 8.3 You have to read it in the Amplified Version. It's worth your effort. You say, how do I do that? You just talk to Google and say, Romans 8.3 Amplified Version. And it will pop up on your screen. We live in a wonderful age. 